It's a great discussion, but one of the questions that yeah, actually... Yeah, they're not going to hire me for anything, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I love candor. So. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> well, I, there's been a lot of analyses about the role of outside groups and outside money. There used to be a day when candidates and campaigns actually controlled their own messages and voters could vote on the basis of the appeals made by the candidates in their own campaigns. And uh, many feel that this is a very unhealthy development for American democracy. But uh, let, me, let me turn to another question from one of the audience members. And this has been analyzed as well, but I'd love to hear your take on the whole question of the changing demographics of Virginia. Uh, the audience member is asking whether the reality today is that it's simply better to run as a Tim Kaine centrist than as a George Allen conservative in Virginia from now on. Depends on what year you're running. Uh, and, and I mean, very frankly, th this, was a, this was an election year. I don't know what the final number is, 74, 75 percent of people turned out. Uh, in next year's gubernatorial year, it'll be less than 50. Um, now, you know, the, the truth is it takes an awful lot of money, organization, and a connection to be able to jump a number from 50% to 75. Mm -hmm. um, and in some areas in the 7th district, we voted over 80, like about 84% of the active voters. Now. That would leave you many other people fine. <laughs> so, um, but what, it, what I can say is that it, it depends. I mean, I think that, number one, I would strongly say that from the Republican Party standpoint, uh, we have a major, major um, need to reach out to uh, new groups and um, you know, we're winning white males, and we win white females, and we even win whites. We even we win white young people under 30. But once we get past those numbers, we don't. And um, and, and we have to have in this state a uh, a serious outreach effort and an involvement with minority communities, which we haven't had on a consistent basis. We have some candidates who do that, uh, particularly in Northern Virginia. We have a number of legislative candidates who are very, very involved in their uh, local communities and do that kind of outreach on a regular, sustained basis uh, at a statewide. But, but in many of our uh, parts of the state, that doesn't happen. And, um, and, and part of the reason it doesn't happen is because of the way congressional and uh, delegate and Senate, state senate lines are drawn. Mm -hmm. When you pack all the Democrats into one district and you pack all the Republicans into the other, neither one has to really talk to anybody outside of his own party. That's true. I mean, if you if you represent Alexandria, why would you bother talking to a Republican in Alexandria? <laughs> I mean, you don't. They can't do anything for you or to you. And if and frankly, if you're in the West End of Henrico County. You don't have to talk to anybody except Republicans, because more than 60% of the people in those districts are Republicans. So there is this disincentive for many parts of the state for either party to do a lot to reach out to the other side, uh, just because the people that elect them. Um, I think that for us, on a statewide basis, we have the bigger problem. Uh, we have to reach out to the uh, new immigrant communities, um, to Hispanics, Latinos, to um, uh, the African American communities, um, because that's where the growth in population is. We have to figure out a better way to communicate with young people than we are doing currently. Um, those are all things that we've got to do on a statewide basis, but in terms of the actual question of what's the better way to run? Depends on whether you're running statewide or whether you're running in a, a, a legislative district. It depends on what year of the election it is. In federal elections, people in Northern Virginia vote much heavier. In state elections, people in Northern Virginia vote much lighter. And the reason is that well, lots of people in Northern Virginia don't care much about what happens in Richmond. And that's just the truth. It's been that way for 40 years. And I don't think it's going to magically change next year. Um, and 
And the reason is that you, you know, uh, we were talking about this at lunch today, is that the news coverage up here is just as likely to be about Annapolis and twice as likely to be about D.C. Council as it is about <laughs> what happens in Richmond. There hasn't been a TV reporter coming to Richmond except on election night from one of the D.C. stations. Um, maybe their inauguration and the election night, and that's about the only time you ever see a reporter, TV reporter from Washington. Um, the Washington Post does cover some, but again, all your news here is split between local government news here, local government Maryland, D.C., Annapolis, us. So, you know, you don't get the, you don't know much about what happens in the rest of the state uh, when you're up here because the, nobody tells you much about it. You have to go find it by looking for it in other places. You can't find it out of, out of the news sources in, this, in North Virginia. And, um, and that's why there's a, and just, and the same is true for downstate. Downstate, people don't know much about what happens up here. I mean, if you don't read the Washington Post every day or at least go through the clipping services, you don't know what's happening in North Virginia or what people are thinking. And there's a significant disconnect because of that. Um, and, but, as, but to the point of, is it better to run as a centrist or as uh, uh, George Allen? Um, it depends on what the election year is and um, where you're running. I, I, I think we have seen over the last decade in Virginia that it is always better to run as a centrist. Over the last decade, we have seen that the candidates who came across as more centrist uh, have won general elections, at least. Um, now, in that sense, we have done a better job on our side. There's always exceptions, but we have done a better job on our side, really led by the efforts of Mark Warner and Tim Kaine, sort of rebranding re the Democratic Party in the state um, between those two guys. Um, and, and I think Virginians are very centrist. Mm -hmm. And actually, let me, let, me, let me revise that slightly. It's actually less that they're centrist. It's less ideological. Virginians are just, as a people, generally, in statewide elections, non-ideologues. And so they connect with the candidates who come across as non-ideologues a little bit better than they do. Again, always with some exceptions. Um, I, I, I say this not because I think he's still in the room. But the one, as a Democratic operative, the one Republican in Virginia that, that scares me the most is Tom Davis. I don't know, yeah. Congressman, if you're still here. Um, but because he gets that. Tom Davis gets that and has been singing that song Amen. for quite some time. Amen. Much to the, um, you know, and, and much of the Republican Party in Virginia has been ignoring that message. Amen. Um, Boyd, where I'm going to disagree with you a little bit is I think the reason why Republicans in Virginia and nationally had a hard time connecting with non-white voters was not a, an infrastructure or a practical issue. It wasn't because you weren't knocking on their doors. It's because you actually don't have much of a message that was connecting with them right now. Women voters overwhelmingly were feeling alienated. Your side was not helped at all by the shenanigans in the General Assembly this last year. Um, Non-white voters, African American voters in 2008 comprised 20% of the Virginia electorate. Um, the other side, as we already discussed, underestimated the strength this time. According to exit polls, this time African Americans comprised 21% of the Virginia electorate. It went up. They were becoming a bigger piece of the electorate. Hispanic voters are becoming a bigger piece of the electorate. It's not just a matter of knocking on their doors. It's having a message that is at the very least, at the very least, seen as non-threatening. And, and I think too many women and non-white voters felt actually threatened by the, by the overall Republican message this year. Um, and I'm not saying this is a function of our race. I think it was, it, it was a bigger problem um, for Republicans. And that was one of the reasons why turnout went up, I think. It was in part because we, our side did a better job around the country of identifying those voters and going to their doors and getting them out. But it was also, I think, a little bit of a sense of self-preservation. Folks feeling like, you know what, we are under assault. And so they turned out. Well, I, 
think that uh, I don't think I can't remember any Republican running an ad on on the issue of immigration. I can't remember any Republican running an ad on the issue of abortion. I can't remember remember any Republican who was running any ads that were talking about things that threatened. I'm not saying in other states. I know <laughs> only in Virginia that I watched the TV, but. There were plenty, but there were plenty and plenty of ads being run against Republicans talking about we were going, that Republicans were going to take this away from you or take that away from you or take the other thing away from you. And it's not, I, I, and I will say that we have some stupid Republicans <laughs> who have said some extremely stupid things over the last few years. I mean, truthfully, the only reason that there isn't a Republican majority in the U.S. Senate today is that we've nominated at least six candidates who destroyed their own exactly. elections in the last two terms. Mm -hmm. And that's the only reason there isn't a Republican majority. If we had nominated anybody other than Sharon Angle, we would have won Nevada yeah. two years ago. Right. If we had nominated anybody except the witch in Delaware, <laughs> we would have won Delaware. Uh, you know, if if, if, if we had nominated anybody except Aiken in Missouri, we would have won Missouri. And if we had nominated anybody but Murdoch, uh, or just left Luger alone, we would have won Indiana. Um, now, you know, we, we have a great propensity, and we have a battle going on within the Republican Party. Um, about what we are all about, and what it is, and what um, and who we are, and what's there. Um, that battle is going to continue on in Virginia uh, this coming year, and um, you know I don't, I can't tell you today what the outcome will be. Um, I can say this though about the point of being a centrist. I, I think Creed was about was pretty much of a centrist when he was running, um, and. and um, uh, I, I uh, now I think that Bob McDonald was a lot better candidate. Yes. Uh, I, I now you know, uh, but Bob McDonald was still the guy that was attacked for having written a thesis in college, for uh, that that said that you know was made to say that women uh, didn't deserve equal place. Uh, our legislate our our legislature our legislature has done some dumb things uh, in terms of issues that it's brought up and that allow ever allowed to come to the floor, uh, and um, you know that that's true. Uh, but, but the Bob McDonald case is an interesting yeah. one because I think it actually kind of makes my point. Bob McDonald, despite being one of the most conservative members, you know, in the General Assembly in the last couple of decades. Did not run as that. He did not run as an ideologue when he ran for governor. He ran as a centrist, um, pushing aside ideological talk. Um, and I thought that was he ran as he was a conservative who ran as a centrist. Running as a centrist, I think, matters. Well, I, I think that I, I would define it a little bit differently. I think that the three Republican governors that we've elected um, since 1993, uh, which were George Allen and Jim Gilmore and um, Bob McDonnell, uh, all are conservatives. They all ran on very um, down to earth, going to fix government. Uh, we're going to try to do some very specific things. <coughs> they kept their promises, um, and I think all of them, uh, you know, did well from that aspect. Uh, the, the truth is that in all those cases, um, I. I I don't know whether all, I can't say that, I, I don't think that all of the candidates they ran against were bad candidates. Uh, I think Reed's was probably the worst campaign uh, <laughs> yeah. of, the, of, of any of them. But, um, but that's as it is. Uh, but I think that the biggest thing is they had all of us, all three of them had a very good understanding of what the suburban Virginia uh, wanted at that time. And they were articulating the messages that of what the suburbs of Virginia cared about, and I think that this this election was one lost in the suburbs. Um, you know, it wasn't in the inner cities and it wasn't in rural Virginia. We won rural Virginia. We had a bigger turnout. We had more people voting in rural Virginia than um, have voted in previous presidential elections, and we won it with bigger margins. Um, in in central cities, I think that's true from from the Democratic Party. The margins were at least as big or bigger 
um, you know, you had them all there. The difference, the difference was in the suburbs. It was in, um, it was in Fairfax County, and it was in Prince William and Loudoun, and Spotsylvania and Stafford, and, and Rico and Chesterfield, Virginia Beach and Chesterfield. And uh, the people that this is, I mean, I, this is not original to me. Uh, it's been, it was coined by, I think, Larry Sabato back in the 80s. But the people that win, the, whoever wins the suburbs wins the election. And um, we did not have a message that, we did not have an adequate message for the suburbs of Virginia. Uh, Bob McDonald had an exceptionally strong message for the suburbs of Virginia when he ran. Um, and the last two, I think it's the last two statewides that were seriously contested were Jim Gilmore and Bob McDonald running for governor, and both of them carried Fairfax County. Um, and that's pretty long distance apart. <laughs> so I'll well, have been part of the Warner and the gubernatorial elections. I'd say those were both pretty seriously contested races. Uh, but, but I think your point is exactly right, is exactly right, that, that statewide elections of Virginia now tend to be won and lost in the, in the suburbs and the exurbs. We are seeing very promising, demo as Democrats, very promising demographic changes um, that we've identified and really sort of cultivated over the past several elections um, where they are becoming more purple. Fairfax is obviously becoming pretty blue these days, although not something we can ever take for granted, as we saw in 2009. Um, Chesterfield is becoming much more competitive. In Rico, Prince William are definitely moving in the right direction for Democrats. The demographic changes um, are, are really driving a lot of that. And so I think you're right, that message, and it goes to the point we were talking about earlier, um, I thought, I thought one of the exchanges I really enjoyed having in this campaign between the two sides was on the issue of, of the women's issues and the stuff that came up in the General Assembly. Um, because the way both sides dealt with it, I think, said a lot about challenges and opportunities that, that, that they face moving forward. The Republican family, whether it was Mitt Romney at the national level or George Allen's campaign here in Virginia, their response when this stuff came up, and remember, yes, there were ads being run about it from our side, but we wouldn't have had anything to run ads on had it not been for your side in the first place. Um, the, the response that, well, these aren't issues that women care about. The issues that women care about are the economy. I'm sorry, I, I, my wife is here in the audience. I learned a long time ago never to presume to tell a woman what she actually cares about. <laughs> um, Good for you. And so to, that I thought was a fundamental flaw in the Republican, the broader Republican messaging this cycle, whereas our messaging was, we know you care about this, and you know what? This isn't just a silly little social issue on the side. This actually is an economic issue. It actually is a family issue. And that, I think, was how our side was better. And I use that just as one example. There were similar examples that could be said about the challenges in the, in the Latino community and in other communities. I think we are going to continue um, to see these demographic changes break in our direction as long as the Republicans um, don't understand how to connect with some of those folks. And once solidly red counties are going to become more purple and more blue as a result. Let me just follow up on that because 2010 wasn't that long ago. And the demographic shift in Virginia in two years hasn't been all that dramatic. So um, I'm wondering, can we draw any specific lessons from this election cycle for the state elections that are going to take place next year based on uh, what you've A couple of things. One, you're absolutely right, Boyd, that turnout matters and the composition of the electorate matters. In 2005, one of the reasons Tim Kaine won was because he was able to identify a whole lot of what we called federal Democrats, Democrats who voted in presidential years but never voted in uh, gubernatorial years. So we went after them. Um, but turnout matters. One of the reasons 2010 was such a bad year for Democrats was because we did not have presidential level turnout and we weren't able to draw them out. Secondly, candidates matter. Candidates absolutely yes. matter. Um, even with all these demographic changes that I think were breaking our way, we wouldn't have won if Tim Kaine wasn't such a good candidate. Mm -hmm. Candidates matter, which means we need to begin the process early, early of recruiting good candidates at the congressional level in 2014, at the General Assembly level for 2013.